Chapter 11 The Elephant's Trunk After the foregoing specimen of the curious beliefs of this extraordinary man, on whom one could at least not lay the charge, unlike the case of so many other noted thinkers, that he didn't put his theories into practice, I resume the thread of my narrative. In the presence of these many adventures and new mental occupations, I naturally didn't neglect the opportunity of making the robber's vernacular my own. It was impossible that the time should not pass quickly. But the nearer it approached to its end, the more my confidence was shaken by oppressive fears. Would the ransom come at all? Although the safe conduct given him could protect the old servant against robbers, a tiger might have rent him in pieces at some point on his journey. Or a swollen river might have swept him away. Or any one of the countless unforeseen chances of travel might have detained him until too late. And Gulimala's flaming glances shot so often and so evilly at me that I felt as if he were hoping for something of the kind, and then perspiration born of pure fear broke forth from every pore. However wonderfully and systematically introduced, and with whatever logic, Vajashrava's reason statement might be established, that in every case in which the ransom was not forthcoming within the proper time, the prisoner in question had to be sawn through the middle with a cross-cut saw and both parts tossed onto the high road, with the head pointing towards the rising moon, I must honestly confess that my admiration for this, scientifically regarded, assuredly astounding performance of my learned friend, was somewhat spoiled by a peculiar sensation in my more than slightly interested peritoneum, particularly as the double-toothed cross-cut saw used on such occasions was fetched, and, to illustrate what he said, set in motion by two horrible-looking fellows, its victim for the moment being a wooden log representing a human being. Vajashravas, who noted that I began to feel sick, patted me encouragingly on the shoulder and said that the thing should not in any way concern me. From this, I naturally believed that, in the case of necessity, he would come to my rescue for the third time. But when I, in most grateful words, hinted at something of the kind, he drew a very long face and said, If your karma should really bear you such a grudge as to cause your ransom to come late, even if only by so much as half a day, then assuredly neither God nor devil could help for the laws of Mother Kali are inviolable. But comfort yourself, my son. You are designed for other things. Rather do I fear for you that one day, after a notable robber career, you will be beheaded or impaled in some public place. But that's a long way off yet. I could not say that this comfort uplifted me greatly, and so I was very relieved when, a full week before the expiry of the allotted time, our faithful old servant arrived with the sum demanded. I bade farewell to my horrible host, who, remembering his slain friend, put on a gloomy expression as though he would much rather have sawn me asunder, and affectionately pressed the hand of the Brahmin, who banished a tear of emotion by the confident assurance that we should certainly meet again on the nightly paths of Kali. Then we left, accompanied by four robbers, who had to answer with their lives for our safe arrival in Ujjaini, for Angulimala, who was very jealous of his robber honour, promised them, as he sent us away, that if I were not handed over safe and sound in my native town, he would flay them alive and hang their skins up at the four corners of a crossroads, and the men knew that he kept his word. Fortunately, however, it did not in this instance become necessary, and the four rogues who behaved admirably on the way may still be in the service of the goddess dancer with her swaying necklace of skulls. We reached Ujjaini without further adventure, and, to be quite truthful, I had had enough with what I had already gone through. The joy of my parents at seeing me was indescribable but all the more it was impossible to wring from them the permission to undertake another journey to Kosambi very soon. My father had lost, as you know, all the goods and all the people in my caravan, in addition to my ransom, and he was not in a position to fit out a new one at once. Yet that was a small hindrance in comparison to the terror which overcame my parents at the thought of the dangers of the road. In addition, we did not fail to hear from time to time of Angulimala's further terrible deeds and I cannot deny that I had no great desire to fall into his hands a second time. Nor was there just then the slightest possibility of getting a message through to Kosambi. The roads were so dangerous that no courier could be paid enough to make the journey, so I was obliged to content myself with memories, and, confidently relying upon the fidelity of my adored Varsity, to comfort myself with the hope of better times. And at last these came. One day, a rumour flew like wildfire through the town that the frightful Angulimala had been utterly defeated by Satagira, the son of the minister in Kosobi. His band had been cut down or dispersed, and he himself, with many of his most notorious followers, had been taken prisoner and executed. My parents were now no longer able to resist my passionate entreaties. 
People had very good reason to believe that, for a long time to come, the roads would be free, and my father was not disinclined to try his luck again. But, at this juncture, I became ill, and when I rose from my bed, the rainy season was so near that it was necessary to wait until that should be passed. Then, at last, nothing further stood in my way. With many admonitions to be prudent, my parents bade me farewell, and I was once more again on the road. At the head of a well-stocked caravan of thirty ox wagons, with a heart full of joy and courage, and urged forward by consuming desire. Everything ran as smoothly on the present journey as on my first one, and one beautiful morning I entered Kosambi, half crazed with joy. I was soon aware, however, of a huge throng of people in the streets, and my progress became ever slower, until at length, at a spot where we had to cross the chief thoroughfare of the town, our train of wagons was brought to a complete standstill. It was literally impossible to force our way through the crowd, and I now noticed that this main street was magnificently decorated with flags, carpets draped from the windows and balconies, and festoons hung from side to side over the road, as if for some kind of pageant. Cursing with impatience, I asked those who stood in front of me what was taking place. Why, they cried out, don't you know? Today, Satagir, the son of the minister of state, is celebrating his marriage. Consider yourself blessed to have arrived just at this moment. The procession is now on its way from the temple of Krishna and will pass right by here. Assuredly, you will never have beheld such magnificence before. That Satagira should be celebrating his marriage was important and welcome news to me, because his seeking the hand of my varsity in marriage would have been, along with the ill favour of her parents, one of the greatest hindrances to our union. So the waiting did not displease me, especially in the realisation that it could not last long, for already we were able to see the lances of a cavalry division which moved slowly past amid the deafening cheers of the crowd. The people told me that these horsemen now enjoyed great popularity in Kosambi, because it was chiefly they who had destroyed Angulimala's band. Almost directly behind them came the elephant carrying the bride. Beyond all question a stupendous sight. The crusted, knoll-like forehead of the gigantic animal, which reminded one of Meru, the mountain of the gods, was covered with a veil of many-coloured jewels. And just as early in the year, when a fiery bull elephant moves along, the drops of perspiration rolling down his temples and cheeks attracts a swarm of bees allured by the sweet odour, so here his temples and cheeks shimmered with the most wonderful pearls, above which dangled limpid garlands of black diamonds, an effect beautiful enough to make one cry out. The powerful tusks were mounted with the purest gold, and from the breastplate, which was made of the same precious metal and set with large rubies, the airiest of Benares muslin hung down and softly wound itself around the powerful legs of the animal, like morning mists around the stems of regal forest trees. But it was the trunk of the state elephant that, more than all other sights, enchained my glance. I had seen processions in Ujjaini, and gorgeously decorated elephant's trunks but never one displaying such taste as this. With us, the trunk was usually divided into fields which formed one exquisite pattern and were completely covered with colour. But here the skin was left free as the ground tone, and over this branch-like foundation was twined a loose spray of lancet-shaped asoka leaves, from the midst of which yellow, orange and scarlet flowers shone forth. The whole, in treatment and finish, the perfection of exquisite ornamental stylization. While I now studied this marvellous piece of work with the eye of a connoisseur, there began to creep over me a homesick feeling. And I seemed to inhale again all the love odour of those blissful nights upon the terrace. My heart began to beat violently as I was involuntarily drawn on to think of my own marriage. For what happier adornment than just this could be invented for the animal which would one day carry varsity, seeing that the terrace of the Sorrowless was famed throughout Kosambi for its wonderful Ahsoka blossoms. In this dreamy condition I heard, near me, one woman say to another, But the bride, she doesn't look at all happy. Hardly conscious of what I did, I glanced upward, and a strangely uneasy feeling stole over my heart as I caught sight of the figure sitting there under the purple boulder chin. Figure, I say, because I couldn't see the face, the head was sunk upon the breast. But even of a figure one saw little, and it seemed as if in that mass of rainbow-coloured muslins Although a body did exist, it was not one gifted with life or any power of action. The way in which she swayed hither and thither at every movement of the animal, whose powerful strides caused the curtain structure on his back to rock rhythmically to and fro, had something unutterably sad, something to make one shudder in it. 
There was real cause to fear that she might at any moment plunge headlong downward. Some such idea may have occurred to the maiden standing behind her, for she laid her hand on the shoulder of the bride and bent forward, possibly to whisper a word of encouragement in her ear. An icy fear all but crippled me, as, in the supposed servant, I recognised Medini. And before this suddenly awakened foreboding had time to grow clear within me, Satagira's bride raised her head. It was my varsity.